God. You are an awesome God. You are an awesome God. Awesome God. Somebody magnify the Lord with me right now. 
We want to see a demonstration of his power tonight. Your presence in this place. Your presence in this place. You're the Lord. Descending like a cloud. Like a cloud. standing with us now. Lord, unveil our eyes. You're the reason. pray that he would show his glory tonight. Lifted up so
Creator God you gave me went so I could pray Your great and matchless name All my days, all my days So let my whole life be A blazing offering A life that shouts and sings The greatest of our King Glory to God sets us in a place and makes us ready for the Spirit of the Lord to speak to us. When we don't have His presence or not open to His Spirit because we've not lifted our hearts and praised, then, then we're not ready to receive what God wants to do in our lives. And uh, I appreciate the worship and praise tonight. Amen. We serve an awesome God. Let's just raise our hands and worship Him one more time together. Hallelujah. 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 Jesus, we exalt Your name. You are the mighty God. There's no other God besides you. No other God can step into your shoes. You are the almighty God. We worship you. You have all power in heaven and earth, Lord Jesus. We exalt your name and magnify your name. We praise your name, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Clap for the Lord right now. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. I feel the Holy Ghost here. And I believe God wants to minister tonight. Now, sometimes we think he can only do it on Sundays. But I'm telling you, God wants to minister into some hearts and some lives tonight. And we've already started on the right track because we started with prayer and then praise. And the next thing is to listen and let what God wants to do in your life, let it happen tonight. Amen. Praise God. You may be seated. I want to share with you just a few minutes about the work of God in East Africa and Tanzania. Sister Smoke, my wife, is uh, not here. She went to a ladies' conference in another, another district, another state. And so I'm going to miss her tonight. Uh, she's an integral part of what we do. She uh, always speaks and uh, takes part in the service as well. But uh, I want to share with you some about what God is doing in East Africa and the, and the Word of God. Sister Smoke needed this chance to go be with some other ladies in a, mission, in a ladies' conference and so I'm glad she had that opportunity, and thank you for allowing that to happen also. Amen. And, uh, you know, I, I see I'm getting some looks up here tonight. I'm not quite sure why you're giving me the look you're giving me. I don't know. Maybe I didn't comb my hair quite right, or I don't know. Maybe it's something. Oh, I think I figured it out. Maybe I'm dressed a little different. Well, in East Africa, we have different cultures, different people groups. It's amazing. You can go from... Uh, uh, Tennessee to other states, and you can hear a different speech. We all speak the same English, but you'll hear a different speech. And even our culture is a little different. I'm from Louisiana, so you'll have to forgive me for that. But uh, uh, originally, I hadn't been there in much in quite a while. But uh, in East Africa, you're dealing not only with difference of speeches or different parts of the country, you're dealing with different tribes. And the tribes will have their own customs. And I may share with you something about uh, one of the gentlemen, one of the pastors, 
and some of the customs that he's dealt with in doing the work of God. But their customs, their culture is different, and even at times there are tribes that are at war one with another. Now that creates quite an interesting mix when you got somebody moving to another place to preach the gospel. But anyway, one of our 120 tribes in Tanzania are the Maasai. Now we just finished deer season probably just a few weeks ago, right? Anybody get a deer this year? Any hunters in the house? We got a few that admitted to getting a deer. We won't ask them to tell us how big or how little it was or anything else. Not really important. They had a good time. That's what they went for, right? To relax and have a good time. We got some meat out of it. Well, the Maasai, they're out with the wild animals because they, uh, for the most part, are cattle herdsmen, and they roam with their cattle and goats to find grass and water. And sometimes that can take them a long, long ways. In fact, there's a pair of shoes out there that are typical Maasai shoes. They're made out of a bus or truck tire. So you want to go look at those and see what they're like. And uh, just think about marching around thorn bushes and all that with shoes like that, open sandals. Well, when they're out with the animals, they will carry one thing for sure, and that's this rungu, wherever they go. And even if they're hunting for some wild meat, this is what they'll use. Now, you might wonder what they can do with this, because uh, if you were out there where the lions were and the hyena, you'd probably want to be there with a gun. I do. I've been out there a few times. Uh, I won't get into those stories. I get sidetracked quickly. But uh, when you're looking at a, you know, 350, 400-pound lion, you really would rather have a gun of some size type instead of this thing. Well, this is what the Maasai carry. And uh, they have been known to run animals off that are attacking their herds and even hunt with this thing. They throw it, and they're pretty good. And uh, got any volunteers? Get up and take off, and I'll show you how it works. <laughs> Trouble is, there's a window right behind you, brother. If I'd missed, we'd all have been in trouble. <laughs> well, I wouldn't do that anyway, but it's just uh, a different way of doing it. You remember when David uh, fought with Goliath? They offered him weapons of, of war, spear, sword, all these things, and armor, body armor, and he said, no, nah, I don't know how to use those things. I'm not comfortable. What did he use? A sling and stones. And then he told them, I know that God will use me because he has saved me before from the mouth of the lion and the mouth of the bear. Now, I don't know what David used. The Bible tells us that he, he ripped them apart, so God must have moved on him and given him extra strength. But uh, he went with what he knew. That was the sling and stones. Well, it's not, this is not much different. Just got a handle on the end of it. So things are a little different. Uh, you see this thing here I'm carrying. And I don't know if anybody wants to take a wild guess what it is. Tail. Keep going. Somebody said tail. I didn't. They said horse. Cow tail. Thank you. It's a cow's tail. Kind of an odd one. Little cows are a little different there. Uh, different type, different breed. But, uh, you know, they, they don't throw anything away in Africa. You, again, the shoes, that's a pretty good example made out of tires. Well, even if something is useless, so to speak, as a cow's tail, Becomes a pretty good fly swatter. I heard somebody say that one too. Keep the flies out of the faith. Or the baby is laying down sleeping. The mother may just wave it over her, the child to keep the flies off the, the baby. Well, you know when they have animals, right, especially cows and goats, you got a lot of flies. Well, repurposing a tail is uh, something they've also been known to do and pretty handy. Life is different. Things are different. Your pastor and I was talking about uh, the culture, about the industry and jobs. There are different types of works they can do, but the majority of people are actually farmers. And those that don't fit in that class fit into the cattle herdsmen, goat, sheep, or raising chickens and getting eggs and that sort of thing. You do have some industry, some employment, but for the most part, they live off the land for the most of the people. And so life is very different. But you know what I've found? Uh, now, Smoke and I have been missionaries 32 years. And what we have learned and found in those years is no matter where we have gone in Africa, there's one thing that is constant, one thing that is the same anywhere we've been, and that is the gospel. Their culture might be different. Their language can be different. And for a person to go to heaven... They got to be born again in Tanzania and Burundi and anywhere else just like they do right here in Humboldt, Tennessee. 
And for that to happen, somebody said it tonight. I really liked what they said. They got to be born again. That's just the beginning of the journey. They got to take off, start running after that. But before you can run, you got to be born, right? And it takes repentance from sins, baptism in the name of Jesus, a burial in Jesus' name in water for the remission of sin, and then the filling of the Holy Ghost, which is a spiritual birth, and it's evidenced by speaking in tongues. Let me tell you something. If you've never heard somebody speak in tongues when they receive the Holy Ghost and that tongue be English, that's an exciting adventure. Let me tell you what happened. When that person I saw receive the Holy Ghost began speaking in English, I listened to their words, and I do not remember exactly their words, but I'll tell you, they were simply praising God. They were worshiping God. Now, that tells me something. Number one, I think the tongues in English was for me to have a witness. I already believed it. I already knew it. I didn't have to have that to believe in the Holy Ghost, but it was a witness that I've shared with other people, and, and just to confirm, hey, this thing's real. This is not some fable or story. This stuff is real. What's written in the Word of God is real. The gospel is real. Amen? This book is real, folks. And people really get the Spirit of God within them and speak in a language they don't know because I try to talk to those people in English afterwards. They didn't know what I was saying. But they were praising God, which tells me God wants to hear you praise Him. If when He fills them out of the Holy Ghost, He speaks through them and is praising Himself, what He really wants is people to choose to praise Him and worship Him and lift up His name. Woo! Now that makes you understand better why worship before service is so powerful. It invites the presence of God because that's what He tunes His ear to ear here is people worshiping Him. Let's just worship Him right now. Hallelujah! Praise the name of Jesus. You are the mighty God. We worship you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. Thank you, Jesus, for salvation. Praise God. Well, it is exciting. It is very exciting doing the work of God. And please, after a service, go back where that table is in the foyer and look at some of those things. What I really want you to do, and I'll reach in my basket here. I won't pull out a rabbit, but I'll pull out something else. And, uh, and I would like for you to take one of these prayer Bible markers. I mean, we've got them out there. And uh, Sister Smoke makes them look really good. She just lets me be on the front with her. But this is, uh, we'll tell you about and, and we'll introduce you to Tanzania Burundi, just the information briefly. But on the back is what I want you to take note of because on the back it mentions cities in Tanzania and below that cities in Burundi where we don't have a church. Now Tanzania itself is almost nine times the size of the state of Tennessee. We're the only missionaries there. We're not doing the work by ourselves. We have uh, about 107 churches and pastors pastoring those churches and saints that are doing the work of God. There's about 14,000 members in the United Pentecostal Church there in the nation of Tanzania. And they're working. We're working together. But there's a lot of places that do not have a church. I, I could not even put all the cities of prominence on this, on this Bible marker. So these are ones we're really asking you to pray about. They need someone to go plant a church. And, you know, the, the, Lord, the Bible tells us the Lord of the harvest told us to pray that he would send forth harvesters or laborers so if he told us to ask him i don't understand all this but he he wants to interact with us and so he gives us things to do for the kingdom one of them is to go and witness to people when you're born again he wants you to go witness to people there is no place for a saint of god to sit on a pew with nothing to do we've all got at least the responsibility to reach out to other people but then he also told us to pray to him that he would send forth laborers. So if you, would you pray with us that God would send laborers to these cities to open churches, preach the gospel, and reach these people? It's been said that no one should have the opportunity to hear the gospel twice before everyone at least has heard it once. And for that to happen, the scripture tells us that people must go and preach. So please pray with us. And uh, we would really, really appreciate that. And you would be actively a part of the kingdom of God in Tanzania, Burundi, the revival that's taking place. And uh, we need more laborers in the harvest field there. If you can't go, at least pray with us. Amen? So, so we appreciate that very much. I told your pastor about a need, and uh, I'm going to solicit your help for that also. Now, Sister Smoke generally uh, does this, and she is very good at communicating 
Uh, but here's a, a wooden handmade bowl from Tanzania. And you can come inspect it. In fact, I'd love you to come drop something in while you're inspecting it. Because what we need is, in fact, we left to come back from, from Tanzania uh, the middle of December. We arrived in the States. And after I returned, or after we returned, I heard news of uh, some saints that moved from one of our village churches, Nyakiswa, to a town called Bunda. Now, I've been talking to the ministers of that region for quite a while. They've been praying about it. We've been praying about it, about a church plant there, and praying that God would send someone there to open a church. Well, he's done it. Since we left middle December, there were eight saints from Nyakiswa that moved to Bunda, began witnessing, having Bible studies in their home, and having home fellowship meetings, and they've won people to the Lord already. The thing is, we don't have a place for them to meet. So when it's raining, where do they go? If it's hot, hot, extremely hot, sunny, and that happens a lot, then to sit out in the open someplace is quite brutal, believe me. And, and we need a place. Now, another thing is, if you say, well, we're starting United Pentecostal Church in Bunda, and uh, we don't know where we're going to meet, so uh, just find us some place. It's a town of 70,000 people. That's not easy to do. We need a consistent place to meet. They need a place where they can begin growing the work of God. And so we got to have property before we can make the next step or do anything else. So I'm trying to get your help tonight. If you would, as you feel led of the Holy Ghost, help us. We need $3,000. And I doubt anyone here can just whoop out $3,000. But collectively, you might be able to finish off that. We can purchase that property and they can begin having church in one location. But whatever you can do. If you have one dollar and that's it, we would appreciate it because others will pitch in and help. We'll collectively be able to do this. If you have more, we need that because we need to plant a church in Bunda and get those people established in a location. We've been praying for several years, and I believe now is the time to begin that work and to get it established. So please help us with that, and uh, you'll help me a lot if you really help me out. So the Sister Moat comes back from this ladies' conference, she'll think at least I did present her situation and help her with the project, and she won't be uh, aggravated me for not uh, doing very good. So help me out there, and uh, you men know what I'm talking about. If, if your wife thinks you're not doing your, her job or the job she left you, you're in trouble. So help me out a little bit here. I need your help. But we, we're excited about what God is doing and, and, and the joy of working in places like that. I, I do want to go to the Word of God. I, I didn't belabor that what I've done and talked about there because I really felt like uh, God wanted me to share something with you. And so I'm going to do that. Um, if you have your Bibles, you would turn with me to the book of 1 Peter. Book of 1 Peter. And we're going to go to chapter 5. And if someone has some questions after service, I will go to the table out there, Lord willing, and be glad to try to answer any questions. Uh, if there's something I can explain back there, I'd be glad to do that. And uh, just to share with you about more about the country, the work, but I want to be obviously uh, conscious of the time as well. First Peter chapter 5, I'm going to read verses 6 through 8. <clears throat> Scripture says, humble yourselves. Therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Thank you for standing in honor of the word of God. I didn't ask you. Thank you. I appreciate that. And verse 7 says, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. And I, I want you to take note of that. I, I don't know whether I'll, uh, I'll speak much on that. But take note of verse 7, casting all your care upon him. He didn't say some cares. He didn't say just the ones that seem the worst to you or the great, greatest needs. He said all, all your care upon him, for he careth for you. And that is important because uh, you're going to notice in a moment my title is your adversary, the devil. Because you have an adversary, it is vital to understand you have a God. And he cares for you. And it's not just you, plural, the world. He cares for you singularly. He cares for you. He cares for you. Let me move on. Verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion 
walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And I'm going to ask you to pray, first of all, that God would help me to be able to share what I feel I need to share, and that God would help each of us to hear what he's trying to say to us. Let's pray together in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Father, we come to you. We know we're only vessels, and we're sent to do the work. And tonight, I believe you've spoken to me. You want me to share something specific. And I pray you enable me to do so, give my mind clarity and help the scripture and the word be open to me that I can share it. God, there's someone or someone's here you want to speak to tonight. And I pray that you would touch their minds, help them to be open to hear. God, help us to push the busyness of the week aside. Help us to, to push aside any thought that would entertain us or captivate our minds. That would buzz. Amen, amen, amen. You may be seated. Your adversary. Your adversary. Now, just as verse 7 is speaking, I believe, directly to every person, he careth for you. You could just turn that around to apply it and say, he cares for me. Well, verse 8 tells you, your adversary. It's very, very, very personal. Your adversary, the devil. And then he also, in the scripture here, tells you who your adversary is. Uh, Sister Smoke and I was at a church uh, last week, and Friday evening and Saturday and Sunday, I'm sorry, Saturday evening, Sunday morning, they had a marriage, uh, I wouldn't call it a seminar necessarily, but a, someone came and talked about marriage and gave some ideas and direction and helping, helping people have a better uh, way to, to build their marriage and to, to strengthen their marriage, and part of it was just communication. But anyway, um, got on a rabbit trail there. Anyway, uh, the, the point she was making oftentimes is that in a relationship, sometimes we react. We react to our spouse. And when there's pressure, there are situations, there's problems, or just plain old, just the day-to-day -day life struggle, sometimes we react to our spouse, and we're not necessarily trying to strike out at them. It's just they're present. They're right in front of you, and so we respond. But the point is, your spouse is not your adversary. The scripture says your adversary is the devil. He is a spiritual being and a fallen angel, and you cannot see him, but he's the one that's actually your adversary. And it's not your boss or a co-worker. You know, they may be the face that's, that's harassing you at times or giving you trouble. It may be a neighbor or, you know, something like that. Sometimes we see our enemy being someone that we deal with or whatever, but the actual enemy is the devil. And he's not just your pastor's enemy, he's your enemy. He doesn't just come against the pastor or the pastor's wife. He doesn't just come against those that are in worship. And I strongly believe that people that are leading worship and the singing and the praising are often under attack because if, if, they, if they are under attack and they are not able to worship with an open heart and open mind, then the church will not be led into worship properly. So I believe often they're under greater attack than people who are not involved in leading the service and worship. But he's not just their adversary, he's your adversary. He's your adversary. And, and we, when we realize that, it changes the perspective of things. We realize, hey, if I'm going to be victorious and I have an adversary, then he's the one I've got to be aware of, watchful of, and he's the one I've got to fight against. And he has tools and methods. He has ways he operates. Well... In verse 8, it tells us something that I learned more about and actually studied about living in Africa because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion. Now, what in the world does that mean? How many of you have seen uh, come face to face with a lion? All right, well, then you've had an experience most people never experienced in North America. Number one, a full size lion will just terrorize you by looking at him. He's not some little little house cat. I mean, they're big. They got big teeth. They're scary when you look at them. But that's not even what the scripture said. Didn't say a big lion. Didn't say a, 
a mangy lion didn't say, you know, a scary lion. It said a roaring lion. So what does that mean? Well, I'll tell you. I, when I was reading the scripture, I began checking it out because we got a lot of lions where we live. And I have actually seen a few pretty close, uh, once closer than I wanted to. But I won't get into that rabbit trail either. But a roaring lion. Let me tell you what a roaring lion is. A roaring, roar, the lions roar in their process of hunting. The way the lions hunt as a pride or a pack is when they see the antelope, they will, the female lions will begin to sneak through the grass away from the wind direction so the antelope cannot smell them, and they'll move down on parallel both sides of the antelope they're hunting and get to the side of them, and some will go as far down as ahead of the antelope. And the male lion will come from behind when the female lion are in position and he will roar and then begin charging at the antelope. Now, animals and humans have a fear factor built into us. And it's for our protection, our, 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 our safety. And that is you're going to fight or you're going to run. When something makes you fearful, you're going to fight or you're going to run. Most often, we run. And so do the antelope and the wild animals. And so what happens when that lion roars it startles them. It scares them. They all of a sudden come unglued because they didn't know he was even there, and, and that roar is right behind them, so they take off running. When they take off running, they're running away from the roar right in the direction of the female lions. And the female lions will close in on them and begin trying to take down one or more of the antelope as they're running past. Actually, the safest direction would be to run toward the roar of the lion, not away from it. Because they'd be running away from the majority of the lions that would try to attack them. So your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, the objective of the roar is to make you run and run in the face of danger. Think about that a minute. I mean, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? When you begin to realize the, what the roar does, the purpose of the roar is to incite fear and cause you to run. And run into danger. Well, I got a picture I want to show you. They're going to throw it up for you real quick. That picture is a picture of wildebeest. Now, the numbers of the wildebeest in East Africa have been estimated so drastically different. I don't know what's correct. I've heard as few as 1 million, as many as 3 million. But the wildebeest migrate every year with the grass, with the water, and they, they move and give birth to their young, and they just travel all year long. And from Kenya down through Tanzania, back into southern Kenya. Through the Serengeti, if you've heard of that, that's in Tanzania. And they'll migrate on a path every year, the same, pretty much the same path, and they migrate in mass. And they come to waters, lakes, or rivers, and they have to cross them. And in those lakes and rivers, of course, are crocodile that uh, want to have their chance at a feast. And during the whole migration, there are lions and hyena and, and uh, African wild dogs and uh, jackals and all kind of predators that move with the herds because they're also trying to survive off of these wildebeest and the other animals that are migrating with them. In this picture is around 400 wildebeest, actually I think it was more than 400, that drowned in this water as they were crossing. Now I happened to see the other morning when I was traveling, ice in the branches and I realized what happened was, after it began to freeze during the night, the Tennessee River kept dropping, and the water kept flowing down, and so the ice was on top. This is not a case where the water's dropped. The water was just as deep as when they drowned as it is in this picture. So you ask yourself, how did those animals drown in water that shallow? Because they were to stand up at probably about their knees. Well, I'll tell you what killed them. It was fear. Because during the night... A lion awoke. He was not hunting. He was not trying to kill an animal. But he awoke during the night and he stretched. And you know how cats will do. He moved and stretched and yawned. And then he roared into the night. And when he roared in the night, these animals were crossing that water. And became so afraid, they began to knock each other down. They began to trample on one another. They went under the water. And as, you know, we would do the same thing, trying to gasp for breath. They sucked water in their lungs, and over 400 drowned in water that if they were standing up, it would be knee-deep. Wow. What actually killed them was fear. 
It was not the attack of a lion. It was not running, uh, just necessarily running from the lions or, or like that, but they were running and they were responding to fear. And I felt in the Holy Ghost that tonight I need to share with you that you have an adversary of the devil. And what he wants to do is to cause you to respond through fear or to fear. And if you respond to fear, you're not responding to faith. You cannot think with a mind of faith and think with a mind of fear at the same time. You're going to be thinking one way or the, or the other. And when faith is in control, you will stand up, you will ask God to help you, you will depend on God. But when fear is in control, you are running this way and that way and are not even using good common sense and you're reacting. Fear will cause you to react. It will not cause you to make the right move or seek God or ask God for his help. And so when the scripture says, your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, what it's saying is your adversary is trying to scare you into doing things that are not right, that are not beneficial, that are not even of God. But he's trying to cause you through fear to run toward danger and run into a dangerous situation instead of believing God, trusting God, and standing firm. That's what he's trying to do. That's the kind of adversary he is. He wants you to react instead of stand up in faith. Now, that takes me to the point of asking, what is it that scares you? There are young people that actually will get into a relationship and get married because they're afraid of being alone. And they end up marrying someone that is not the will of God, and they can end up on a dangerous path in a dangerous situation. There are people that because of fear of cancer, their fear of cancer drives them to making bad decisions and wrong turns in their life. There are people that because they're afraid of, of blindness or they're afraid of homelessness, they're afraid of pain, they will run here and there instead of allowing God to direct their life and lead them. Folks, some people cannot even believe for healing because fears grip their heart and they're so afraid they cannot dare to believe that God can heal. There was a missionary I just read today, uh, a, a, a news or a response I received, a praise report I received by email of how she had been admitted to the hospital, was very, very sick, but through it all she had peace. She had prayed and knew that God was in control and she was uh, feared to be septic and a very sad situation. But she went into the hospital, and she had prayed. Her husband prayed. They had faith, and they got a great answer. God had touched her, and the beginning of the report was not the end of the report. Yeah. Sister Smoke, my wife, uh, several years ago, was admitted to the hospital in, in Africa. We didn't know what the problem was. There was a different diagnosis that all turned out to be incorrect. And when the doctors, when we finally got her to Kenya, where there was a decent hospital, the doctors x-rayed her and saw that she had blood clots all throughout her lungs. And there's a very, very dangerous situation. And we prayed, and by the next morning when they took another x-ray, the blood clots were gone. But fear cannot cohabitate with faith. You're going to be thinking through faith or thinking through fear. And every individual must take control of that fear and cast it down in Jesus' name and stand by faith. Because if you don't, your adversary has already got you running in the wrong direction. And you're not running to God through faith. You're running away from the other situation. You've got to take control, conquer the fear, stand up in Jesus' name and take control of that fear, that spirit of fear, and cast it out so that faith can operate. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10, there's a story about a, a centurion, a Roman soldier. And this Roman soldier was not a Jew. I, I don't know what his understanding of, of the Scripture and, the, and, and religion of the time was. We don't know much about it. We don't have the full explanation of the Scripture. But what we have was he didn't feel that he could come to Jesus himself. So he sent someone to ask Jesus to heal his servant. Now, folks, that's, that's interesting. It wasn't his child. It wasn't his wife. It was a servant or a slave, 
Someone who was in his employ, we'll say, that was under his authority and was working for him, and he had enough desire that God would do something, and he sent someone to Jesus to ask for healing for this person. And then he must have started that way. I don't, I don't really understand exactly the details, but when, when the, the option came to him, he said, I, don't, I didn't feel like I needed to come. I, I didn't need to come ask Jesus myself. I didn't have that position to do so. But he said, I'm a man under authority, which means he understood the ability for Jesus to speak and do something and to cause it to happen. He understood that Jesus had the ability and the power to perform a miracle. And so he said, if he says it, it's going to happen. Now, folks, that's, that's awesome faith. That's awesome faith. If Jesus says it, it's going to happen. I understand authority, and he has that authority. And Jesus said, I've not seen faith like that, not in Israel. Among the Jews who were believers, he said, I hadn't seen faith like that. But this centurion, this man of authority, understood authority to the point he said, if Jesus says it, it will happen. He has that authority. Wow, if we could get a hold of that kind of faith. If we could get a hold of that kind of faith to realize if Jesus says it, it's going to happen. If I ask it in faith, it'll happen. God can make it happen. He has that authority. He has that power. There's an old man of God that I have great respect for. He's passed now. His name was Brother T.W. Barnes. And uh, one time he said, it's as simple as this. Jesus said it. I believe it. That settles it. In other words, there's no more question. If Jesus said it, all I have to do is believe it, and that's, that's the end of it. it. It's done, folks. Somebody tonight needs to say, I'm going to get that kind of faith. There's something that's in my life. There's something I'm dealing with. There's something I don't see the way through, but I'm going to stand up and tell the devil to get behind me. I'm going to cast fear aside, and I'm going to say, Jesus said it. I believe it. That's the end of the matter, folks. Hallelujah. That's what God wants you to do. Because you see, the devil has come to kill, to steal, and to destroy. That's what he wants. The wildebeest are gone, but just think about that picture. The lion was not even trying to kill them. But don't you know there's a lot of lions and hyenas that had a feast that next day. There's a lot of crocodiles that had a huge feast after the end of the, that next morning when they all awoke and found those wildebeest all dead. Well, they were happy about it. Well, the devil would be happy for your destruction. But that's not the will of God. That's not the will of God. But if you will conquer fear and allow faith to reign in your heart and your mind, you can, God can do some awesome things for you and in your life, and that's what he wants to do. He wants to deliver and set free. Stand with me if you would. Hebrews chapter 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. You do not see what you need God to do in your life. You don't see it. Just as we have never seen creation. We were born when creation was all said and done. But just as we believe that God spoke these worlds into existence. You can either listen to the scientists who are assuming they have the answer. Or you can read the word of God that tells you the answer. And it tells you God spoke into existence. Just as it takes faith to simply accept God's word, word about creation, it takes faith to accept God's word about any situation in our life. When you ask, you put it in his hands, trust him, and let God perform the miracle. Verse 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Is there somebody tonight that has something in their life that you would seek God and say, Lord, I believe. Lord, I cast down fear in Jesus' name. Fear of the unknown. Fear of sickness. Fear of, of, of disease. Fear of whatever you can name or whatever it is. I cast it down in Jesus' name. And I stand by faith. I come to you in faith. I come believing, God, that you are my Savior. You're the mighty God. My adversary, the devil, 
does not have power in my life, but God has power in my life. I've been filled with the Holy Ghost. I've given my life to God. I've turned my life over to God. And I don't see the answer, but I know God has the answer. That's faith speaking, folks. Let's raise our hands and talk to God. Just right where you're at, raise your hands and talk to God. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we believe you tonight. We want to be like the centurion in that we, we may not know all the answers. We not, may not understand how it happens, but we know that you have all authority in heaven and earth. You have all power in heaven and earth. God, whatever situation we're battling with or dealing with, God, you already have authority and power over that. And we rebuke and take authority over the fear and over the attack of the adversary in Jesus' name. He may be my adversary, the devil, but I serve a living God who cares for me. I serve a mighty God who cares for me. I serve a God who is able when no one is able. And in faith, I call on the name of Jesus. In faith, I claim the miracle and the work of God. In faith, I believe and I know that God will work in my life because he will respond to my faith. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. There's somebody tonight that would just like to have your pastor pray for you. You, have a, you would like to simply to ask God to, to do something. You want to let us lay hands on you and pray for you. If you would like that, if you need that, if you have faith for that, just come up. Let us pray over you. Let us call over, over you with the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us plead the blood of Jesus. Let us pray over you and ask God to work in your, in your situation. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. If it's healing you need. He's a healer, folks. He has cured cancer. He's cured diseases that seem to have no, no answer. And I want to say something else. Sometimes we give up asking and we give up believing before the Lord is ready for you to answer. Look at the situation where Paul, the Bible says Paul sought God earnestly three times. And it was not until the third time the Lord told him, basically, no, my grace is sufficient for you. I, I strongly feel that often we, we ask once, we may even ask twice or three or four times, five times, but we never actually hear from God. So I challenge you, if you've asked God for something and you've never heard him say, no, I'm not going to answer that prayer, my grace is sufficient for you, don't stop asking. Don't stop asking. I don't care if you've asked a hundred times. Retain your faith, continue to ask, and believe God. And if he tells you no, okay, then he wants you to experience it with his grace. But if he hasn't said no, then don't stop asking. Don't stop seeking. Don't stop knocking. Get him to the door. Get him to the door. Let God respond to you with a, an answer, a miracle, a healing, or, or if he chooses a no, whatever he chooses, he knows best. But don't stop too soon. Praise God. Would you pray with us? Raise your hands. We're going to pray for these folks. Raise your hands and pray with us. Let's pray in faith, folks. Let's pray in faith. Let's ask in faith. Let's let God respond. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.
right now. Let's believe right now together. Let's believe and pray right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Let's thank the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I don't know the Lord has done yet. I, I just want us to take a moment to pray. I just feel in my spirit God is not finished someone who hasn't responded he wants to respond so I'm asking you where you are right now stretch your hand forward and ask God to work in your situation whatever it is I just feel a hesitancy in my spirit that God is not done with us yet we've not we've not touched his throne of grace yet someone has not responded the way the Lord wants them to in Jesus name 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 we believe you, O oh God. Your word is true. Your word is real. You have all power in heaven and earth, O oh God. We seek your face. We seek your anointing. We seek your grace. We seek, O oh God, for the release of the power of the Holy Ghost and the presence of God in our lives. Let the presence of God minister. Let the power of God work, I pray. Let faith arise in our minds and our spirits, O oh God. Let faith arise within us, O oh God. Let faith arise within us, O oh God. We can conquer the attacks of the adversary. We can conquer the fear that comes from the attack of the adversary. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Let's pray, church. Let's pray. Let's entertain the presence of God a moment longer. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Satan, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. You have brought fear and you have controlled through fear. And we cast that down in the name of Jesus. And we're going to stand by faith. We're going to exercise faith in God. Faith in the Word of God. Faith in the power of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Pastor, praise God, praise God. Let's thank the Lord for His Word together tonight. God, I worship you. Thank you, Lord, for your word that would encourage us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. We're going to leave this uh, bowl up here tonight. And if you feel to uh, bless in uh, helping start that work, uh, I know the Lord would bless you for that. We appreciate Brother Smoke being here with us on this Wednesday night and you coming out on a cold, cold Wednesday night. But I'm thankful for what the Lord is, is doing here at Harvest Church. We don't have anything Thursday or Friday. And uh, I don't think we have anything actually Saturday. That's very unusual. Uh, but we will be back worshiping together twice on Sunday again. Brother Andrew uh, Thurbush is scheduled to preach Sunday night. And uh, looking forward to what the Lord's going to do among us. Greet one another in the name of the Lord. Make sure you greet our guest. Also, make sure you tell the missionary how much you have enjoyed the ministry of the word of the Lord tonight. And also hearing about the country of Africa, Tanzania. God bless you. Thanks for being here. Praise.